biology students, this is Mr. Gales. Today I'm going to bring you the first screencast session in our unit called Biology, the Study of Life. This screencast is going to focus on the characteristics of living things. As we go through this screencast, since this is your first time doing this, I'm also going to give you tips about how to take notes appropriately from a screencast. Make sure that you have your two-column note paper ready and that you have uh, perhaps the template that was given to you in class so you understand how to do your notes, and we'll get right into it. Now our first slide here looks at the characteristics of living things. This is a summary slide for all those characteristics. What you'll notice here is that the characteristics of living things has been underlined. That's a main idea. Any main idea has an underlined font. And usually we'll see them at the heading up at the top of the slide, but sometimes it's here within the body of the slide as well. Uh, headings or main ideas go on the left side of your notes. And on the right side of your notes, you're going to put definitions, lists, examples, could be drawings, could be questions that you have that you need to talk about in class. So, great example here. Characteristics of living things, that's your main idea on the left. These are the properties that all living things share. In other words, if we can consider it to be alive, it has to have these properties. So we have a list that should be familiar from your reading. All living things have cellular organization. All living things uh, will go through the process of reproduction. Metabolism, in other words, the use of energy, how we obtain that energy. Homeostasis, maintenance of internal conditions, heredity, responsiveness, growth and development, and adapting through evolution. Those are all characteristics that living things share. Now, in this screencast, we'll be going through each of those characteristics in turn, giving you a little bit of information about each one and providing some examples as well. Okay, here's our first characteristic. This is cellular organization. Remember, main ideas are underlined, so the cellular organization is the main idea that'll go on the left hand side of your paper and then on the right hand side will be the details in this case it's kind of the descriptions of what this property means so cellular organ organization all living things are made out of cells um, the one of the defining characteristics of life here on planet earth is that if we find something that's living it has to have these basic units called cells cells are the smallest units capable of all life functions and when we look at the structures within a cell we can see that these structures enable the cell to carry out life functions for instance there's a nucleus that controls the the hereditary features of the cell and there are structures called mitochondria that are involved in the metabolism of the cell uh, now cellular organization we have two different major groups of organisms that we can look at so our next main idea that relates to cellular organization is going to be unicellular organisms. And again, this will go on the left-hand side of your paper. On the right-hand side, we're going to write down definitions and examples. Unicellular organisms are organisms where the entire organism is made up of one single cell. And the examples that are most clear for students to think about are bacteria and protists. In this picture, we see an electron micrograph. This is an image that's been magnified several thousand times of bacteria growing on the surface of a leaf. These bacteria are so small that there can be as many as 10 million per square centimeter on the surface of the leaf. These are organisms that their entire org the, the entire organism is essentially one cell. Uh, other examples of unicellular organisms include the protists. This is an example of a protist called a paramecium. You've probably seen these under the microscope. These live in pond water. This is a single-celled organism, a little bit different from a bacterial cell in that it contains a nucleus. Now, other kinds of organisms in terms of their cellular uh, structure are multicellular organisms. Multicellular organisms are organisms made up of many cells. And what you should be thinking about here, the next main idea, multicellular organisms goes on the left, and then your supporting information goes on the right. Uh, okay, so we talked about multicellular organisms as are organisms made up of many cells. An example here is this plant. This is a fern. You've probably seen ferns out in nature before. Um, when we drill down, if we were to use a, a microscope and look more closely at the leaf of a fern, what we would see is that fern is made up of these individual units called cells. And if we were to go even further into that cell, we will see that the cell has specialized structures which carry out special functions within the organism. One defining organism uh, or structure for the organisms that we consider plants are these structures called chloroplasts. These are the structures that help to carry out photosynthesis. All right, so cellular organization. We saw unicellular organisms and multicellular organisms. Our next property of life is reproduction. Now, reproduction is the process of producing new organisms of the same type. If we look at the picture here, 
we can see that this is probably the mama elephant and we can see her cub elephants here. Um, we know that when an elephant reproduces, it's gonna have baby elephants. Um, one, I think, important concept for you to understand about reproduction, reproduction is not necessary for the survival of an individual organism, but it is necessary for the continuation of the species. If enough members of the species fail to reproduce, that species eventually will die out. Now, two major types of reproduction that we need to consider. Asexual reproduction, and notice, this is gonna be a main idea because it's underlined. So this should go back on your left-hand side. Asexual reproduction involves a single organism reproducing by itself. And the example that we see here is of a bacterial cell. So again, asexual reproduction, the main idea, goes on the left. And then on the right-hand side, this would be a definition or an example, right, involving a single organism reproducing by itself. And then you could even put down this example. You could draw the picture. You could use this as an example. This is a bacterial cell. And the way that it reproduces it's, is it simply grows in size, it reproduces its single chromosome, and then it divides. Now, one word that you've probably heard is clone. A clone is an exact genetic copy. Organisms that reproduce asexually tend to produce clones of themselves. Another type of reproduction is called sexual reproduction, and this involves two parent organisms each contributing the genetic information through what we call gametes. This picture represents the human life cycle, and you can see we have two parent organisms, in this case people. Um, a process called meiosis produces cells that are referred to as gametes. These are the reproductive cells, the egg and the sperm. Through the egg and the sperm, the parent organisms contribute genetic information uh, to their offspring. In this case, we're looking at something called a zygote. Now, that zygote will grow through a process that we'll talk a little bit later. Big idea here, sexual reproduction introduces genetic variability because we now have genetic information from two different parents. Okay, next characteristic we're gonna look at is called metabolism. Metabolism is defined as all the chemical reactions in an organism. Um, big idea about metabolism is that these reactions that go on within the body generally either store or release energy. So with reference to energy, we're looking at energy storage reactions and energy releasing reactions. Energy is important. Living things need energy gr to grow, develop, repair damage, reproduce, essentially to carry on all the other functions of life. So as you see in this picture here, we have a, a river otter who is having a nice dinner of, looks like some sort of crab here. As that river otter is eating his dinner, he's taking in a form of energy called chemical energy that his body then can use to, to release usable energy. The next picture I'm gonna show you is a process called cellular respiration whereby the food molecules are taken in and through these chemical pathways, usable energy called ATP is released. This is the kind of energy that's used for growth, development, repair of damage, reproduction, all those things that make us living. Now, one other type of organism that we need to touch on from metabolism are organisms that are able to make their own food. Plants and other what we call autotrophs carry out a process called photosynthesis, and this picture summarizes photosynthesis. These organisms take in light and water and carbon dioxide, and they release as a result of this reaction sucrose, which is a type of sugar. Uh, they also give off oxygen. So these organisms have a unique ability to not only release energy in food, but to make food for themselves. All right, next main idea, homeostasis. You should get the idea here again. Homeostasis is underlined, it's a main idea. It goes on the left-hand side, and then definitions or examples go on the right. Homeostasis is defined as the maintenance of stable internal conditions in spite of changing ex external conditions. So a great example that I think we're all familiar with is body temperature. There might be large external fluctuations in the external temperature, and we're starting to experience that here in, in, as we get into the fall season. It's starting to get much cooler. Um, through homeostasis, we are able to maintain a fairly constant internal cellular environment, and there are control systems that allow that to happen. Um, the reason that this is important is for our cells to function correctly, there needs to be a relatively constant environment inside our bodies. Other examples of homeostasis that you should jot down would be maintaining a constant blood volume. We have to have enough blood to carry oxygen through our cells. pH balance, um, the maintenance of a correct balance of acid and base in our cells and in our blood. And then water balance, making sure that our cells have enough water. All right, next main idea, heredity. Heredity is all about passing on genetic information. 
And so we need to understand that genes are the basic units of heredity. Genes are composed of a chemical called DNA, and you can see a model of DNA right here. We're going to be studying DNA in pretty good detail during our second quarter. Uh, when you think about heredity, heredity is really the major reason why children resemble their parents. Parents pass on genetic information to their children, and, and so because of that, there's sort of a, a blending of traits that, that children have that reflect their parents. Now, one concept that we need to understand about heredity is that because this is based on DNA, genes are based of or composed of DNA, any change in the DNA can result in a change in, in the way that the genetic information is uh, essentially translated. Normally, we have red blood cells which are round and can carry an, a full load of oxygen and they can freely move through our blood vessels. An example of a mutation which changes the DNA code and can be passed from generation to generation, as we see here, is called sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is where the proteins that form the red blood cells are misshapen, and therefore the cells themselves are misshapen. They carry less oxygen, and as you can see here, they can get trapped in those blood vessels. This usually leads to a fair amount of um, fatigue and even pain. Uh, heredity will be a major focus for us throughout the year in biology. All right, responsiveness. This is our next main idea. This will go on the left-hand side, and then examples again go on the right-hand side. Responsiveness is the idea that organisms react to external stimulus. And you should understand that a st stimulus is anything that causes a response. In this picture, you might notice that this plant seems to be growing in one direction. Can you guess what the stimulus is here? If you guess that this plant is growing towards the sunlight, you're absolutely correct. This is something that's called heliotropism. Helio is the sun, tropism is growth. Um, what's probably happened here is this plant has been placed in a location where there's probably a large amount of sunlight over here to the left, and literally that plant is growing towards the sun. Another great example of responsiveness is when our body gets cold, right? If it's very cold outside, our nerves um, are able to sense that, send signals to our brain, and our brain then sends signals to the muscles which trigger us to shiver. That shivering is producing friction between muscle cells and it's producing heat which warms our body temperature back up. All right, growth and development. Next main idea, growth and development. Growth literally means to get bigger in size. And as you can see the picture here, we know that this baby elephant is eventually going to get very big. Multicellular organisms, like elephants, for instance, grow by producing more cells. And we go back to this picture of the human life cycle. Once uh, we reach this stage of the zygote, this is what's called the fertilized egg, we go, all of us started off this way, a single fertilized cell. We go from that single fertilized cell to being adults through this process of cell division. Uh, you've probably heard of this before. It's called mitosis. And so one cell becomes two, two become four, four become eight, and so on until you know, you're sitting at about 100 trillion cells in your body. Now, to contrast growth with development, development involves a change in the physical form or physiological makeup of an organism. In this picture, I love to show for development. Take a look at that picture and see if you can figure out what it is. If you guess that that is a butterfly coming out of a cocoon, you've got it exactly right. This is a, a, a what's called a mammoth man, monarch butterfly, and it's got some assistance here. Somebody's helping it to come out of its cocoon. Um, when you think about what happens with butterflies, they start off their lives as caterpillars, and then they go into this cocoon where they go through this process of development. They essentially morph into what we are more familiar with as their butterfly shape, so a change in the physical form. Physiological makeup of an organism is sort of the underlying chemistry that changes. You guys, as students, uh, teenage students, are going through this process yourselves, something called puberty. There's a change not only in the underlying chemistry, but also in the physical forms of your body at this time in your life. All right, our final main idea, our final characteristic of living things is evolution. So this, again, is a main idea that goes on the left. Evolution is a change in the inherited characteristics of a species over a great period of time. This change results from a process called natural selection that was described by Charles Darwin, and we'll talk about evolution quite a bit during our third quarter. Now, natural selection is a process in which organisms that have favorable characteristics are more likely to survive and reproduce. These characteristics don't come from nowhere. They are genetically based and they usually result from small changes in genes from generation to generation, generally either mutations in the genes or genetic recombinations. 
The picture that we see here is of an owl butterfly, and we talked about the owl butterfly in class. You can clearly see here the patches on the wings that resemble owl eyes. Uh, the reason that this is beneficial and makes this butterfly more likely to survive and then reproduce is that it's probably going to scare off predators who think it would be an owl. Another great example of natural selection uh, helps us to understand where our modern giraffe with the really, really long necks would come from. If we go back to the ancestral population of giraffes, we would probably see that that population had some giraffes with shorter necks and some with longer necks. And as the vegetation that the giraffes fed on changed over time, and the trees, maybe got, the vegetation was a little bit higher up in trees, those giraffes with longer necks those are favorable characteristics. They're more likely to get more food and have more energy and therefore be more likely to survive and reproduce. All right, so that's a quick look at the characteristics of living things with definitions and examples. Um, I would encourage you to go back over this screencast again before we take our exam and give you a chance to uh, think about the information one more time. And if you've got any questions as you went through your screencast, you need to make sure that you ask those questions in class as we have our discussions. All right, so this has been Mr. Gales talking to you about the characteristics of living things. See you in biology class.